Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm Paige. I'm an alcoholic. And you know, it's uh, so, such a privilege to be here with you guys. And Fred, I saw that in the comment. You're you're the Hall of Famer. Um, but I love I love how we're talking about sports and we kicked it off with a sports reference. Sports. Um, so yeah, no, I'm an alcoholic and I'm so grateful to be here with you guys today. And it's a privilege to be speaking about step six and step seven, because man, these are, and to be fair, I would say this about any steps, but I'm like, these are exciting steps. There's so much in them, but I might not see that if I just look in the big book and kind of gloss over. But there's incredible, powerful directions in our literature, in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, and, and it's exciting. So kind of first and foremost, what, what the heck? What the heck is a defect of character? What the heck is a shortcoming? And what I want to preface this with, if you have a different idea of what they are, you're right, I'm wrong. You win. You are right. You are absolutely correct. I am wrong. Frequently wrong. Title of any inventory I've ever written. I'm wrong. But what it makes sense in step five, it says, I looked at the, I shared the exact nature of my wrong. And then I'm going to become willing for God to take something away in step six. And then to ask for something to be taken away in step seven. Well, in my mind, it doesn't really make sense for me to share one thing, become willing for something else to be removed, and ask for a third separate thing to go. It just kind of makes sense. It would be a logical, natural flow. And the flow that I have is kind of like garbage removal. And in fact, why don't I dive into that metaphor? Because I am so sorry. If you guys are not here for metaphors, this is going to be a long talk. Uh, I'm so sorry. It's going to be a little metaphor heavy. All right. So if you're picking up what I'm throwing down, we got some metaphors. And so what I've come to find is at the depths of my soul, there is a spiritual house. And if you're, again, if you're picking up what I'm throwing down, you're like, yeah, I like that metaphor. All the metaphors are consensual. You can say, no, I don't have a spiritual house in the depths of my soul. It's fine. But for those of you who are open to the idea of a spiritual house in the depths of your soul, what I want you to know is that your house is good. Your house is incredible. Your house is wonderful. It has been created by the most incredible, capital D, capital A, divine architect. It is wonderful. Girl, the property taxes on that must be high. You know, ooh, that's a valuable house. I don't know how property taxes work, but that feels like that's what it is. So your house is worthy. It's good. It's valuable. Now, going back to my house, I'm not talking about your house anymore. This is my house. It's, it's, it's a mess. You guys, it is bad. It is bad. Like I, I am a spiritual hoarder. You know what I mean? Like call in TLC, bring in the cameras, hoarder. Like it is, it's bad, y'all. Like, and I'm, and again, we're talking about we, me. We're not talking about you. In my spiritual house, I got these things. I know that nobody in this meeting here today could ever relate to something like this, but I've got these things and they're called resentments. I know I'm alone, but my resentments, they're like newspapers that are decades old. Yes, decades. I've been alive that long. Uh, and I'll hold on to old ones, you know what I mean? So decades old. And they're piled all the way from floor to ceiling. You know what happens when I got newspapers that are lining the walls? They're piled all the way to floor to ceiling. It blocks out the windows. And it blocks out the light. And I find myself, I'm sitting in darkness. And I got these things. I know I'm the only one here with these. They're called fears. And they're like these empty bottles and cans that are strewn all over the floor. And because I'm in darkness, I can't see where I step. I can't see where I stand. And every movement that I take, they clank and clatter and sound bigger and louder than they really are. And I know I'm alone on this, but I got this stuff. It's called sex conduct. It's a little like the dead cats behind the freezer. I know they're there. I can smell them. No cats were harmed during the making of this metaphor. About real clear, it is only a metaphor. No cats were harmed. We don't got to call like this spiritual SPCA. It's all good. Only a metaphor. And so what am I doing in that fourth step? Well, I'll tell you what I'm doing in that fourth step is I'm getting that stuff and into bags and into boxes. You see, these steps don't happen in isolation. It is a progression. And so I start to begin to pull down those newspapers one by one, and I start having a look at them. And you know what happens? 
because I find out the information was wrong the whole time. I thought it said extra, extra, read all about it. Everyone else is a jerk. I come to have a look and it says Paige is the jerk. Who knew that's where the freedom would be? But one by one, I start pulling down those newspapers and that light starts to come into the window. And I love the metaphor of God as light because light is not what I see. Light is the way in which I see. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, what I mean is I got a room over here and, and the lights are off and it's in darkness. Now, if I go around the corner, I turn on that light. Everything in the room has changed and yet nothing in the room has changed. And it's like that with the spiritual journey. I don't know about you, but for those of us who have taken the fourth step and, and continued on with this work, your childhood got better. I know mine did. It didn't change. Family got better. Mine did. They didn't change. The jerks on the highway, did they start driving better for some reason? They didn't start driving better. How I saw them changed. Everything changed and yet nothing changed. You see, once that light begins to come, I can see how if I rely on that light, I don't have to step in those fears and I can use that light to clean that stuff up. And one by one, I start putting those bottles, I start putting those cans into bags and into boxes. And then I go deal with the cats. Yep. And I come up with the same, as a result of doing that, I come up with the same sound ideal so I can be a responsible spiritual pet owner again in the future. You know what I'm saying? And so in the fifth step, when I sit down with God and another human being, what am I doing? Well, I'm getting all of that stuff out of the house. You know, and I, I, I like to say this because in, in step five, we've got the word admit, right? And there's two ways to look at the word admit. And don't worry, I'm going to tie this into six and seven. Uh, the one way is a bit of a confession. Like I got to confess to you. I've got to admit that I stole your car. I peed on your carpet and I slept with your husband. You know, I mean, I got, I got a, a confession. I'm just kidding. None of that happened. It was linoleum. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so that like that, that's a confession. But there's another way to look at the word admit. Let's say we were going to go to an NHL hockey game because we want to see all the Swedes play. See what I did? I cut it in. Got all the best Swedes playing in the NHL, right? I get my ticket. It might be a little overpriced. I have no opinion. Um, but I get my, I got my ticket. And what is it going to say on the ticket? It's going to say admit one. So another way to look at the word admit is not just a confession, but a letting in to be let in. I'm going to let in more and more of God's light and I'm going to let in another human being. Then that fifth step, I get all of that garbage out of the house and I take it to the curb. You know what step six is all about? Step six is all about becoming willing for the garbage man to come and take it away. Doesn't make sense in step six to, to hold on to those bags of trash. No, I love it, it's my trash. I'm a hoarder. I have a tendency to do that, though, right? It's got memories. I love it, you know? And, and then what's step seven? It's about asking, making the call to the 1-800-GOT-JUNK guy, the cosmic garbage man, to come and take it away. That's what six and seven is, is all about. It, and that's what's getting removed. And that is what is getting relieved from me. And I, I don't know about you guys, but when I got to six and seven, I, I, I wanted to be, in, I wanted to be a defect removal. I wanted to be in the spiritual waste removal department. Kind of, oh, it's a good metaphor. Oscar the Grouch, you know, I was living in that trash. That, that was me. And oh man, it was such a good metaphor because that was me, like cranky and miserable. I also don't know if everyone around the world has seen Sesame Street, so this might not be the best metaphor, but that's what I'm referencing going to be obscure today. Keep coming back. I know I will. Um, and so what I want to do, man, I want to be in the defect removal business. I want to do it. I don't know about you, but I show up to my defects of character and I, I want to deal with them. You know, I am going to, listen guys, I am going to work really hard on my procrastination. 
later, you know, I, I'm going to overcome my anger and I'm going to really let go of my anger and I'm not going to be angry. I'm just going to let go of that. It'll be great. You know, I am free. I'm just no more than this, you know, that's what it's like for me. Heck, I don't know about you. I, I'm going to listen, listen, you guys, I'm going to get freedom from the codependent need to be liked and validated in approval. I'm gonna get freedom of putting you guys in the place of God in my life and giving me a sense of worth. But before I do that, could you tell me how this talk's going? Um, I kind of need you to like me. Is it going okay? Can you, can you just validate me a little? Just tell me I'm worthy. <laughs> uh-oh, don't, uh -oh, don't actually give me that validation. Because you know what happens? I get it, and it's never enough. I need more. It's like, validate me until I burn my life to the ground. You know what I'm saying? Right? I have never been able to overcome any one of my own defects on my own power. See, in the third step, I got some news. In the third step, I got my pink slip, my spiritual P45 for those that live across the pond. You know, I got fired from the management position of my life. And you might say, hey, Paige, that, that seems a little bit harsh, getting fired. I don't know about your life, but my life was unmanageable. I admitted that in step one. Do you know who managed Me. I managed my life into an unmanageable position. I managed my life into a dumpster that was on fire, that was careening off a cliff. If I managed anything as poorly as I managed my life, I ought to be fired. So I got my pink slip. Right? I'm fired from upper management. And then what I realized in step three, I got, I'm in step two. We point to it in step three, but in step two, I was given a new employer. I don't know much about this employer yet in step two and in step three, but I got a new employer who will provide everything that I need if I keep close and perform his work well. Not what I want, which is annoying. Um, those are different. Uh, who knew? Uh, me experientially after a while when you stop getting what you want but you get what you need oh it's painful and amazing at the same time and you see that I'm given my job my job is to go out and work for God and again if this is not a metaphor that resonates with you that's cool I've got more I'm so sorry so many metaphors <laughs> but I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna work for God and you know in the third step is it gives me this like really cool like principal agent and and here, what it actually means is I'm working on God's behalf. I'm a representative of God, but way more fun than that is Agent Page, double O Page, uh, working for God. I got my gadgets. I got my like M. Is M the is the lady the 007 lady? I don't know. I really should have looked this up beforehand. But like, I got my gadgets. I got my supercar. I got all my stuff. I got a rocket. Woo! Because you're gonna launch. I'm all excited. What is my cool super agent job? House cleaning, house cleaning. I gotta clean that house. I'm like, oh man. And so I did all that work in the house cleaning and I get to the sixth step and it's like, girl, can I get a promotion here? Did you see all that work that I did and it was work? And, and, and God is kind enough to say, well, sort of, you are going to be relegated to the willingness department which does not feel like a promotion. Because what do I want to do? I want to overcome these defects of character. I want to win. I want to do it. I want that power and control. But what's my job? In step six, my job is all about willingness. All about willingness. I don't know about you, but for me, step six is prime willingness real estate. You know what I'm saying? Like I am never more willing for those defects of character to go than step six. And here's why. See, in step six, I just spent several hours telling God and another human being about how these defects of character have hurt myself, have ruined my life, have caused irreparable, not necessarily irreparable, but a damage in all of my relationships. Man, I'm willing. So it's right after that, and it's right after I spend that quiet hour with me and God, reflecting on all of the work I've done so far. And it's right before I got to go out and make amends for those things. I mean, I don't know about you. That is prime willingness real estate. I'm never more willing for them to go than right after I shared with another human being. And right before I got to go make amends for that behavior. Prime willingness real estate. And that's my job. 
you see one of the things is it talks in step six about like the book is always meeting us where we're at you know and that's that's what i love about the book alcoholics anonymous it's not expecting me to be somewhere that i'm not it will meet me where i'm at and will give me a direction on where i need to go so if i spend that time in that quiet hour and man there's beauty and value in that quiet hour it is powerful what can happen you know where i was talking about step six last night and and a friend of mine was talking about it's after that quiet hour that I get that delighted you know the fifth step promises yeah I'm not delighted right after but that quiet hour that's where that turns to delight and six and seven becomes that pressure release valve that that journey that turning to freedom this turning point to this to the rest of my life and it says that uh, we've emphasized willingness as being indispensable. So my job is to show up with buckets of willingness. That's my job. And it says, are we now ready to let God remove? God is doing the removing. I don't get to do it. I'm not spiritual waste removal. That's upper management. I was fired from upper management from for gross incompetence. I am in willingness. That's more my speed. <laughs> And it says, are we now ready to let God remove from us all the things which we have admitted are objectionable? And he now takes them all, every one, every one. And that's the thing, because I mean, like, am I willing to let go of all of it? Am I willing to let go of all of my dishonesty? And, and yeah, of course, I'm willing to let go of the dishonesty that I can see on the surface that's caused me problems. But am I willing to let go of, of that dishonesty of saying yes when I really want to say no? Am I willing to have that honest, difficult conversation with the people around me? You know, that thing that I don't want to say, but I know I need to if I'm going to get some freedom. That. Am I willing to let go of that? Am I willing to let go of the idea of what people think of me? Am I willing to let go of that? I mean, man, it's a big ask. But the book is meeting us where we're at. It says, if we still cling to something, we will not let go. What does it say? It doesn't say kick kick myself in the butt. It doesn't say live. And I was close in a bad word. I didn't know. Uh, it doesn't say beat myself up. It doesn't say live in shame. It doesn't say you're a bad AA or a bad 12-step member. You're a failure. It says we ask. We ask God to help us be willing. And that's what the spiritual journey is about. See, my job is to build willingness, willingness. That's my job. My job is to, to have anything. And this is something I've been talking about a lot lately. My job is willingness. My job is not worthiness. You know, that's my job is willingness. And if there is any, any spiritual action that, man, I don't know if I could take, I, I'm afraid to take. I, I don't know if I want to make this amends. I don't know if I'm ready to let go of this defective character. I don't know if I'm, maybe we're newer and it's like, man, I don't know if I'm afraid to ask somebody to sponsor me. I'm afraid to work on my fourth step. I'm afraid to do my fifth step. You know what I can do? I can pray for the willingness. I don't want to pray and meditate. We can pray for the willingness to pray and meditate. I can always pray for willingness. It's a little bit of a catch-22 because if I am willing to pray for willingness, I can build momentum from there. But if I'm not even willing to pray for willingness, I might be in some trouble. You know, we can start small and build that momentum and that momentum will snowball. And you know, here's the thing. What, what are my defects of character? What are my shortcomings? And from my experience, they can fall into two categories, selfishness and self-centeredness. Those two categories. Every single one of my defects of character, I can pigeonhole into either one of those. And selfish is how I act in the world, right? And self-centeredness is how I think and I perceive. So bear with me. When I slept with your husband, peed on your carpet, and stole your car, that was selfish behavior. When I was worried you didn't like me because I did all those things, that was self-centered. Does that make sense? That's, that's the difference. And in, and in step three, it talks about selfishness, self-centeredness. That, we think, is the root of our trouble. See, I am driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity, and I step on the toes of my fellows. And they retaliate. 
oh, just one second. Willingness doesn't mean, yeah, wanting to. Yeah, actually, I'm going to go on that tangent. For those of you who come to the, the big book study I do, you know, throw things in the chat. We're going to bounce around and go on tangents. Willingness does not look like, why, yes, I would love to. I can't wait to write that inventory. Oh, yes, I would love to make amends to my ex. That is not what willingness looks like. Willingness can look like a terrible attitude, but doing it anyway doing it anyway. That is what willingness looks like. I, ha I have a spot C that I, I work with. She is my most willing and begrudging at the same time spot C. I have never seen anyone eye roll as much as her and yet take the action anyway. And she eye rolls, takes the action. When she takes the action, she gets well. When she simply eye rolls, she gets sick and that's my experience too. I don't think I have the ocular dexterity to eye roll. I'm not gonna try it. <laughs> It'll make my brain stop working. But I that'll make my brain stop working, but I will casually use ocular dexterity. I I get the I'm a weirdo. Anywho, not a defect though. Being weird, not a defect. But fixating on how I'm weird and I'm different and I'm less than all of you, yeah. That self-pity, you know that self-pity, that warm blanket that feels really good, but turns into a noose? That one. Oh, and actually, we'll talk about that. Heck, we'll talk about that. Uh, uh, I was like, oh, should I go back to the original tangent? Yeah, I'll go back from the original tangent. We'll talk about self-pity here in a moment. Somebody remind me or don't. We'll see where we go. It'll be an adventure. And <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I sometimes am as surprised as you are where we go with, with these things, <laughs> you know? But when we talk about like, okay, what is a defective character? What is the shortcoming of selfishness and self-centeredness? You know, it's one of those things, if we ever said, hey, I, I, I started driving the bus again, you know, or I was, I was taking my will back. I don't know if it happens like that. But what I want you to know is anytime I'm leaning into those defects of character, I'm not driving the bus. What is driving the bus is the defects of character. A hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. I think, hey, maybe I did an okay job. You know, I didn't do great with, with my alcoholism or my addiction, but I don't know, I can do this work thing. I'm gonna drive the bus with that, but I'm not driving the bus. A hundred forms of fear are driving the bus and we're going off a cliff. And see, what are these things? these defects of character, where they seem to originate from, in my experience, it's from its conscious sense of separateness from God. You know, in many ways, somebody like me, an alcoholic, an addict, I'm a little like a spiritual canary. You know, back in the days, they would have people in, in the mines, and they'd be working, and they'd have these little canary birds that would be tweeting and tweeting and tweeting. And what would happen is if gas was, like, toxic gas was exposed, the birds were going to be more sensitive to the gas and they were going to stop tweeting and that knew because they died and that and that was and that was the sign to get out of the mind and i feel like somebody like me with this alcoholism i'm a little like a spiritual canary there's something wrong i feel this separateness i feel this pain because i'm separated from god there's something wrong and doing all the stuff that i can to try to anesthetize that to try to ease that pain but the things that i use seem to cause more pain see i, I try to i try to drown it out with alcohol i try to numb it out this is my experience with crack cocaine i try to stop that pain but it makes that pain worse see when i'm in pain all i can do is think about my pain and so I'm, I'm self-centered, I'm centering on my pain. And I operate from that place of pain and that I act in a selfish way. And the things that I try to do to operate from pain create more pain in my life than those around me. That's what a defect is. A defect of character in my experience is simply the things inside of me that are blocking me from that power. And yes, they're coming from pain. And so I, I, what I want to say is, is what that means is that the root of who I am is not bad. You know, I talk about, you know, in, in step seven, I'm going to ask my creator to remove these things from me. And oftentimes when I stand at the precipice of six and seven, I don't know who I will be with, without my defects of character. I don't know who I will be without these shortcomings. I don't know. because I've never lived without them. And what I have to do is I have to take another leap of faith. But you know, what happens for me is these defects, they get removed. And if they are removed, 
what that means is that they are not me. They're not me. I am not my defects of character. I am not the worst things I've ever done. I am not the depth of my shame. That gets removed. And what that points to is that the depth of who I am is something good. Man, if I was new and I heard me saying this, I'd be like, maybe you, Paige, but not me, you know? Maybe not you, Paige, me, Paige. Oh, I've created a paradox. That's confusing. Uh, but I, I wouldn't have believed it because I was so filled with self-hatred and self-pity. I was sharing about this yesterday. When I when I got here, I was at, and it was shortly after I got here, actually. It was after I got sick. And after I got sick, I was drowning in self-pity and self-misery. And I was that type of person. I would take the air out of the room. You know, I would come in and I would be Captain Buzzkill of the Buzzkillingtons. I was miserable. I was talking with a friend of mine a number of months ago. And she said, Paige, when I met you, you were the most negative and self-deprecating person that I had ever met. So what that means is I win. I win. I'm the most negative. Yes, I win. And that's not who I am today. There's a, a level of enthusiasm that's a little annoying. I know. Uh, and perhaps a little bit of joy that's, oh, it's time to dial it down. I can't. Uh, you know what I mean? And I didn't do that. I didn't wake up. And at that period of my life, I had people that told me, Paige, you got to do affirmations in the mirror. And I want to be very clear. I'm not being critical of doing affirmations in the mirror. I'm not being critical of that at all. But that was not something I could even do. That was not something that I could even approach. I hated myself with just a level of like vitriol that like apparently was unparalleled, you know, because she had never met somebody like that. And who I am today is not that person. And what's changed? What's changed is my willingness to seek and do God's will. What's changed is the depth of me diving into this work and this way of life. That is what's changed for me. You know, I had a sponsor that asked me one time, Paige, how do you demonstrate willingness? And I, I know there are people that really resonate with act as if or act the opposite. Heck, I have people that I work with and I'm like, girl, you act the opposite because that really works for you. That doesn't work for me. And that's not to say that that's bad or that's wrong. I'm just sharing what my experience is. That's not what works for me. Because I, I couldn't, I can't manage the power to do that. So what do I do? I look at it a lot like the St. Francis prayer. What I need to do is get myself out of the way and let God work through me. That's the meaning for me of let go, let God. Letting go of all that stuff that's blocking me and letting God work through me. And the other way in which I demonstrate willingness, it comes from Bill's story. It says we must turn in all things to the capital F, capital L, Father of Light, who presides over us all. Turning in all things to what I believe God's will for me is in this moment. You know, and if I'm on step four, you know what God's will for me is? Finishing step four. You know, if I got an amends to make, you know what God's will is for me? Making that amends. I got to take daily spiritual action. You know what God's will is for me? Taking that daily spiritual action. It's working with the next newcomer, helping the next spot. See, that is God's will for me. And there's another prayer that I find helpful, a helpful way to demonstrate willingness. It's our step, our step 11 prayer in the big book. And it's that prayer, how can I best serve thee? Thy will, not mine, be done. That prayer, that for me is all about willingness because I'm, I'm out here trying to be a channel. I'm here to be an instrument. I'm here to be helpful and I'm here to be useful. And when I am in the here and now, and see that is where God is in the here and now, that's where the change happens. And you see, going back to that inherent sense of worth and, and worthiness that I couldn't even begin to approach. You see, this thing is a gift. It's a gift. I didn't earn it. I didn't become worthy of it. I sure as heck did not deserve it. I didn't. I took some actions, and let's be frank, I took some actions that I thought were a little lame and could not possibly apply to somebody like me. You know what I mean? I took some actions I didn't want to take that I didn't think would help, and then a change happened to me. And when it happens to me, I know that I didn't do it. And you see, this whole thing is not about climbing this ladder of success, which I thought it was, where I'm defeating the next you know, the next defect of character, like it's a video game, like level boss, you know, pew, 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 I beat up my shortcoming. Yeah, I'm going to move on to the next one. No, that's not my experience. Actually, actually, oh, I didn't plan to tie this in, but I'm going to tie this in. 
when I, when I am trying to overcome my defects, and it's a little like that experience. Maybe you had it growing up or maybe you have kids and, and they, they did this thing. And it's where uh, you got an older sibling that's playing the video games and the younger sibling really wants to play. And so what does the older sibling do? Gives them a controller that's not plugged in. That's what it's like. I'm working so hard on these things. My controller isn't plugged in. I'm just looking at that one. It's not plugged in. That's what it's like for me. I, I'm not plugged in. It's not doing it. And the more I work on it, the more frustrating it is because I don't have the power, but God has the power. The God of my understanding has that power. So I lean in to that power. And you see, I'm not defeating each level of defect of character. I'm giving more and more of myself to the unconditional love that is God. That's what I'm doing. It's an outpouring of myself to others. And I just want to share. I just want to share some experiences with you of what that looked like for me. So this was a, a number of years ago. I was outside of a meeting and I was, I was smoking with a friend of mine. I still smoked. I actually, depending on time, I'll talk about that because that has gone all over that. So I was, still, I was having a cigarette outside of a meeting, as you do. And I was like, hey, friend, I haven't seen person A in a long time. I don't need to keep the fake cigarette going, but for some reason I am. Boop, boop, boop. Got to hatch it. Uh, <laughs> focus uh it's a fake it's not it's it's, it's just my hand uh I'm sorry um I was like hey person a have you seen person a I haven't seen person a in in a while I wonder how he's doing and my friend now this is my friend who is a delightful wonderful squishy human being who doesn't dislike anyone my friend made a face and I was like oh and being the spiritual giant that I was, and clearly still am, I was like, I am getting that information out of you. I'm going to poke at Brian. You're going to tell me what that face is about. And so my friend confessed. My friend confessed that person B told my friend, so there's some gossip involved. Person B told my friend that person A said that he didn't like me. And I was filled with self-pity. And do you know what happened in that moment? I was like, oh my goodness, I don't care, I don't care, he's right, he's right, I really was filled with a lot of self-pity, and man, I share that with you, because that was not who I was when I got here, when I got here, I would have to go find person A and person B, and I, I'm not confrontational, I'm not going to address it, but I'm going to try to get them to change their mind about me, and ooh, it is going to be fixated, and it's going to be subtle, and I got to control what I think they think of me, and I'm going to live an obsession. No, I was like, that's fair. That's fair that he thinks that, and that was a freedom I could not have ever imagined, and what happens between Paige, who was obsessed and hyper-focused, I'd come into a room, people would be talking, they stop talking when I come in, <gasps> it's about me. How, how did I get from there to, oh my gosh, person A, that's fair, you're right. This work, this work, I dove into this work and this change happened and I didn't earn it and I didn't deserve it. I just received the gift. And and then I got a little bit of time. I actually don't know. I'm not keeping track of time. Sorry, Steve. Um, by the way, if you're wondering, sorry, Steve, is not how we make an amends. <laughs> Just if you don't have a sponsor. It's not, hey, sorry, Steve. That's my bad. Uh, <laughs> but um, I have this other story. And, and it's, again, this is why willingness for me is about seeking God's will. There's a spiritual um, activity or the spiritual... Um, exercise that happens about once a year and sort of the thrust and it, it happens to be religious in step 11 it says be quick to see where religious people are right and I run with that and I have so much fun and I've had oh man I might go way out no somebody tell me to be quiet um politely though please uh, <laughs> or yell it's whatever I'll be fine um I'm just thinking I'm just thinking about all these experiences with step six and step seven um, and so I'll tell this one, then I'll maybe tell that one. I'll maybe wrap up with that one. Now, nah, I don't know what I'm going to do. We'll find out. It'll be a journey for all of us. So I was doing the spiritual exercise and the spiritual exercise is for a period of time. You give something up, you add something to your prayer life and you find an extra way to be of service. You do that for a, a, a number of days, a substantial number of days. 
And I had done that a number of years and, and uh, had incredible experiences with it. And uh, I knew what I wanted to add to my prayer life, and I knew the additional way I wanted to be of service, but I didn't know what I wanted to give up. And so I was kind of running it by some sponsees, and two of my sponsees, they both said, well, Paige, you could quit vaping, because I had switched from cigarettes to vaping, because I liked my nicotine to taste fruity, because that's delightful. Uh, and I'm an adult, so I want it to taste like candy, you know? Uh, I just took to it right away. And they're like, you could quit vaping, and I'm like that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I never rank my sponsees, but if I did, you'd be at the bottom. Absolutely not. What a stupid thing to say. Ugh, ugh. And so what I did was I, I went to two-way prayer. And this was an incredible experience. I went to two-way prayer. And, uh, you know, I asked, hey, what should I give up for the spiritual holiday? And, uh, you know, and, and I went through the process of two-way prayer. I won't explain the whole process, but if you're interested, I'll tell you about it after. Um, you know, and uh, it, I don't even think it was in the writing part, but it was, I think it might have even been when I was sitting in the silence in God's presence. And what came to me, it was like the fifth mayo, who are you to say there is no God? What came to me was how big is your God? That was what I heard. And what came with that is an understanding of paid you either trust me or you don't. You're asking these sponsees to take the leap of faith, take that leap of faith. So I got it loud and clear. I'm going to give up vaping. And so as we're approaching that holiday, I, it, God showed up and I was working with sponsees and this was before COVID, so I was meeting them in person and, and I, like I was back to back to back to back, that has continued on. And, and my nicotine levels were going down because I wasn't able to sneak out for a vape in between like I used to, you know what I mean? And I'm like, ah, oh, it's meant to be, it's meant to be. The day before, the day before I was supposed to give it up. Uh, I was like, oh, no, oopsie doopsies. I have made a terrible decision. Absolutely not. I'm going to give up being mean to me or something like that. Uh, no, no, we're not. We're not doing it. We're not giving up vaping. Oh, what a terrible idea. And I show up to work with the sponsee. I received a sponsee from a fifth step. And then I had another sponsee right after. And in between the three of us, we went out for a smoke. And, and we we're just chit-chatting and talking about it. And then as I was talking about it, you know, the, my vape had a little lanyard and the lanyard caught on the brake of my wheelchair and smashed to the ground. And I haven't had any nicotine since. And that's, that is not, and that's not, by the way, I could not quit. Like I, I am not an ex-smoker. Like I'm not over here like, those things will kill you. No, I'm not like you. It's no, I didn't quit. I took surrendered action and God does for me what I cannot do for myself. You know, and, and speaking of borrowing and, and uh, doing different holidays, uh, there's a, a New Year holiday that I did where um, you go over a flowing body of water. And essentially what you do is one by one, you toss your defects of character. You take them from a piece of bread and you just, I was hunking ch chunks of bread into a river is the quick summary. That's what I'm trying to explain. And then the spiritual summary is little, each little piece is like a defect of character. And thankfully I did, I just done a, like, you know, I've done a, you know, four through nine. So I, ha I happen to have a bit of a list of defects of character. The, the first year I did this, you know, it's, it was at a first, so I grab, I grab the pieces of bread. I, there's a bridge that overlooks a river, not far from my house. And I was just kind of checking, you know, and I'd imagine what the defect was. And I would, and at first I, Listen, I'm clearly an adult. I gave it a throw. Like, let's see how far it'll go. You know, like, woo! and then no word of a lie, my codependency. So I, I gave that chuck to the codependency and a fish ate it. I'm not even kidding. And then I was immediately, immediately like, oh God, can fish have bread? So I don't, I don't think, I don't think God took it on that one. You know what I'm saying? And so, but in that experience, what was happening for me? is I stopped throwing, I stopped throwing. But I began to hold that piece of bread, that little piece of bread over the water. You see six and seven, I'm not chucking. Six and seven is all I'm doing is a slight letting go as I reach towards God's will. And the defect falls, it falls. And where does it fall? Another beautiful metaphor of God is water. You know, it's water. It falls into the water and I can watch as it's carried away. I don't do any of that. I didn't make the gravity. I didn't make the river. You know, and there's a beautiful spiritual teacher 
who talks about that being united with a power greater than myself. It's a little like the drop of water falling in the river where the two become one and they're absolutely inseparable. And I, this is this is another story. I feel like I'm supposed to be wrapping up soon and I will. What's, what's the biggest lie ever told in a 12 step meeting? I'll end with this, lies. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but this was uh, this was a couple years ago, and it was the uh, ten year anniversary of, of when I got sick and and ended up in a wheelchair and uh, with a number of neurological symptoms. And as I was approaching that ten year anniversary, I could feel that self pity rising. I could feel that pain rising, and man, and I did not want to fall back into that self pity. And so I leaned back in, and I'm I'm doing another set of steps. I'm doing this thing, and you know, and I as I was and as I was writing on that inventory, I just, you know, I was sitting and, and I, I could see that a lot of my resentments were based in the defect of character, which is judgment. Just real quickly, that defect of character, which is judgment. What I found that for me is, is I'm coming to the world with this less than ego, this feeling of who I am is not enough. And I got to judge you to give me a little boost of I'm better than so I can feel a little better for the moment. And then I feel worse. That's the pattern of judgment for me. And honestly, that's the pattern of most of my defects of character for me. But I was seeing that all of these were based in judgment. And I, and I was doing some work and I was taking a little break and I was listening to a spiritual book, the spiritual book for the same, same lady who, who spoke about union with God being the drop of water, being united with the river. And in that book, she said, you cannot say that you love God if you do not love his children. And in that moment, I felt that judgment fall. It fell from me. It fell. It wasn't me that did it. It fell. And, and of course, I have moments, but man, it has never come back to the same, the same way that it did before. What six and seven for me is all about is taking that surrendered action and leaning into what I believe God's will is. And this is, <laughs> oh, this is what I'll end it. And I ended it with this last night. I promise on this one. This gift truly is a gift. Sobriety, emotional sobriety, freedom from these defects of character, they're a gift. And what I mean is I do not earn it. I do not deserve it. I did not become worthy of it. What I do is I put myself in a position to receive the gift. If you imagine Christmas morning, imagine, you know, it's dark outside. We've got the tree and actually you can look at we got we got a Christmas tree. Yeah, I know you're like, please don't point me out, Paige. Just look in your squares. You'll see a Christmas tree. Uh, <laughs> a Christmas tree. And, and it's the lights, the lights in the house are off, but the lights on the tree are on. And it's that warm Christmas glow. And underneath that tree, underneath that tree, there is a gift. That gift has been beautifully wrapped got the most incredible immaculate bow and on it it's got a name tag and that name tag has your name on it it's got your name on it it's already there I didn't earn it I didn't become worthy of it I didn't deserve it what do I got to do I got to wake up I got to wake up Christmas morning and I've got to go down those stairs to receive the gift so if you have not received the gift please let us help you our life depends on it Thank you for letting me share.